so good evening one and all now we are going to start the first session of the third day so at the onset i would like to welcome dr p padam grishan he is the speaker for the today's session so dr padam grishan obtained mtech in electrical engineering from nit warangal phd in electrical and electronics engineering from nit trichy presently he is working as a assistant professor in the department of electrical engineering at nit agartala before joining the nit agartala he worked as a research fellow in mechanical engineering science at university of surrey uk he is, his research interest are energy management control systems for electric and hybrid vehicle and renewable energy so these are not limited to these are the main research focus with this brief intro i would like to request to dr padam grishan to start the session yes sir thank you very much sir for the introduction and before starting the session i would like to thank uh, the coordinator of this uh, workshop dr uh, arvind jain sir and uh, dr bikram das sir for inviting me to share my and giving me an opportunity to share my ideas and knowledge that i have uh, in this field also i would like to thank uh, our uh, my present organization nit agartala for permitting me to give this workshop and providing the uh, resources for this so with this uh, let me start the session let me let me just share my screen okay sir i hope uh, the screen is visible quite visible quite visible yes yes thank you sir for the acknowledgement so uh, in this session the session is actually divided into two parts in the first session we will be discussing about uh, the introduction to electric vehicles and in second section uh, i'm going to discuss about uh, the electric vehicle charging technologies so this uh, part is more important for as far as this ftp is concerned because um, right now we can see uh, there is a larger uh, you know protrusion of electric vehicles into the uh, market and uh, because of the because of this there is a great uh, power demand that is going to arise in the power sector also uh, we are charging the evs uh, through our grid so there are a lot of power quality issues that we need to take care so as a power system engineer and power electronics engineer we should have some minimum knowledge on this electric vehicle and the charging technologies associated with this so with this uh, we could able to proceed the research in a better way uh, and also uh, to solve the issues related with the power system so that's the motivation for uh, this lecture i guess so so in, as a, so we will start the first session in first session let us see about uh, Uh, the electric vehicle fundamentals so this is the outline of my presentation my outline of presentation is goes like this so first i'll dealing with uh, i'll start with the introduction where i'll be discussing the motivational facts behind uh, the electric vehicle and then uh, i'll discuss about uh, the difference between uh, ic engine that is the conventional vehicle internal combustion engine vehicle and the electric vehicle and then i'll move on to further basics about uh, Uh, the electric vehicle where i'll be discussing about uh, the powertrain components associated with the electric vehicle and also i'll be illustrating a small example uh, design uh, for the electric vehicle like like how to design a motor and how to uh, select the capacity of the battery for that particular vehicle so after which i'll be discussing about the powertrain components so power train so the components which are uh, basically responsible for uh, transmitting the power from the source to the wheels of the vehicle so all the related components such as battery converters you know differentials 
all this part will are the components of the powertrain and then uh, how these powertrains are controlled what are the control strategies available in the literature we'll just see an overview and then finally a concluding remarks for this session so let's proceed with the uh, introduction part so there is a motivation for this uh, uh, electric vehicle uh, market dominance so there is a paris agreement uh, which was held in uh, 2015 in Paris, where it is an international treaty on uh, climate change. So, based on this Paris Agreement, the um, there is a there is a uh, treaty put forward that is holding uh, means there is a, a, in, a increase in the average global uh, temperature. Uh, so, we need to restrict this uh, increase in the average global temperature well below two degree. So, we need to limit this increase to 1.5 degree. So recognizing this would be, uh, you know, reduce the risk and impact of climate change. So many countries have come forward uh, for this um, treaty and uh, each of the countries have put forward their own uh, SDEs, strategic plans to mitigate uh, this climatic change. So, for example, uh, the UK, based on this uh, prioritization of decarbonization, outlined in this Paris government, the UK government has committed to achieve net zero green energy emission by 2050. Also, uh, our Indian government has put forward a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, SDGs, uh, strategies uh, to adopt green energy and uh, the uh, electric vehicle technologies in uh, Indian markets. So let us now see what are the primary factors associated with this so first with regard to that uh, the carbon dioxide emission from the fuel combustion in india we will see so there are many sectors which produce this carbon dioxide emission so the major sector which is responsible for this carbon dioxide emission is the electricity and heat producers so we are generating power uh, mainly uh, from the fossil fuel based energy sources so which are uh, primarily responsible for generating this uh, carbon dioxide emission so here our uh, electricity and heat producers are the major uh, you know producer of this carbon dioxide emission and second comes the industry where uh, you, we have to use this um, you know uh, we have, while manufacturing you might be in a position to you know generate uh, uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases um, in the atmosphere and third comes the transportation sector where uh, uh, most conventionally uh, now currently mm, the conventional uh, IC engine that is internal combustion engines vehicles are dominating the uh, transportation sector so which will produce a lot of harmful uh, gases into the atmosphere which is responsible for the CO2 emission as well so the transportation forms the third basic sector in the uh, carbon dioxide emission in the India so there are other sectors as well like uh, residential sectors commercial agriculture and financial consumption so most of, I mean, these are these are not that significant when compared to the uh, three major sectors. So, since transportation lies in the third sector and generating the carbon dioxide emission, so we should we should uh, you know try to give some importance to it, and uh, you know we need to uh, some so we need to adopt uh, green technologies towards the transmission. That's the reason why we are moving into electric vehicle uh, market. So, second fact is that. Uh, as you can see the plot which is uh, given here in the right hand side like uh, which shows the increase in the gasoline price from the year 1998 to uh, 2022 uh, so this is typically uh, in indian rupees like uh, as you can see this plot the graph is like increasing from uh, 1998 to 20, uh, 2022 as you already know that Mm, you know, most of our uh, power generation plants are depends on, uh, you know, uh, the fossil fuel based energy sources. So also uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, powering or fueling our vehicles uh, based on this uh, fossil fuel energy sources such as gasoline, diesel and other things. So the, f the fuel prices uh, is also on uh, in the increasing side. And um, the third factor, uh, just to demonstrate that uh, the what is the current installed capacity of power station in India, this is as on uh, January uh, 2023. So as you can see, uh, around 50%, approximately around 50% of the installed capacity out of uh, 411 uh, gigawatt 
around 50 percentage of installed capacity which is 204 um, uh, gigawatt is based on the coal that is uh, fossil fuel based energy sources and um, now uh, we are increasing this uh, renewable the second uh, you know contributor in this uh, chart is the renewable energy sources res so which uh, takes care about uh, 121 gigawatt of electricity energy so this trend is is keep on increasing when we look uh, backwards uh, during 2014 or uh, uh, 2010 uh, the 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 coal based power station is uh, is dominating so which we, which was around uh, around 70 70% previously so right now the coal based power stations are coming down and the renewable energy sources uh, the power station based on renewable energy sources such as solar farms, wind farms are increasing. Right? So, and also there is a fact that uh, the av uh, annual global uh, electric vehicle sale is on increasing. It is estimated that in, in 2050 based on our literature, it is estimated that uh, in 2050, uh, the electric vehicle sale will uh, hit uh, 101 million and uh, the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle sale will hit around 50 uh, uh, millions right so the you know the the sales or uh, the dominance the electric vehicle and plug in electric vehicles are dominating the markets currently so so we, there is there will be a huge demand in terms of power system for uh, energizing these um, uh, you know uh, the vehicles electric and electric and plug in electric vehicles so as a power system engineer we have this uh, responsibility uh, to mitigate uh, this effectively yes so based on these primary factors so with regard to the transportation sector how we can able to address this environmental concern that is our primer, uh, primary objective so one uh, uh, you know solution is that to use the battery electric vehicles so in wider way so wider use of battery electric vehicle will slightly reduce the uh, you know environmental concerns or the climate will eradicate the climatic change and introducing hybrid electric vehicles to reduce carbon dioxide emissions so all of a sudden we have investigated a lot of resources for generating the conventional uh, internal combustion engine based vehicles but um, we cannot suddenly you know move into the uh, ev technology so the technology will transfer through the hybrid electric vehicles which means that uh, it will be a combination of internal combustion engine plus electric vehicle here Right. So, so this is the way that we can move towards the electric vehicle. So first, of all, it will start with the hybrid hybridization, and then it will move to the electric vehicle. Uh, you know, dominant. So, second is that third is that uh, we need to develop efficient energy management uh, algorithms to use. Uh, you know, uh, which is used in the hybrid electric vehicle, especially in case of hybrid electric vehicle, we will be using internal combustion engine plus. Uh, the battery electric vehicle which is uh, so how the power sharing is going to happen between this um, electric internal combustion engine and electric vehicles so that is what we call as uh, energy management algorithm so this the objective of this energy management algorithm is to achieve uh, you know less fuel consumption right so how, how how efficiently we can going to do that so that is one possible way of addressing and another possible way is that uh, Right now, uh, you know, as we have seen in the previous, um, you know, the chart that 50% of our power uh, generating sectors based on the is based on the coal, coal based energy sources. So, if you are charging our uh, electric vehicle using our conventional, uh, conventionally, uh, conventional, uh, you know, um, energy sources, uh, so it is again uh, going to, you know, transform the pollution from the power generation sector to the transportation sector so i'm sorry so from the transportation sector to the power generation sector so again the you know the generating station will be uh, emitting the you know the you know the carbon dioxide emission and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere so the effective way of mitigating this is that using charging electric vehicles through renewable energy sources such as uh, wind farms and uh, you know solar uh, farms so that way we can uh, you know address the concern and using more energy efficient and less carbon intense energy sources there are there are energy sources which will produce less carbon 
so we have to effectively use that uh, and uh, how we are effectively utilizing that and also uh, how efficiently we are using that that matters so this i already have discussed so these are the possible ways to mitigate this concern and um, yeah we will now move into the history of automotive industry so during the uh, starting of or uh, the earlier days of uh, automotive industry there were uh, three vehicle technologies which were uh, competing among uh, each other for market dominance one among that is the internal combustion engine based vehicles so as you know the internal combustion engine based vehicle so it is it is powered by fossil fuel based or uh, energy sources such as uh, gasoline or diesel so earlier uh, it has the problem of uh, noise difficulty in starting and it has short driving range and uh, lower maximum speed these are the problems associated with the internal combustion engine vehicles at the early stage so let's move let's see the second uh, vehicle industry which were dominating in the history which is a uh, steam steam based vehicles so here uh, the water is heated and then it is converted into steam and this steam power is used to run the or drive the vehicle so there there arise the issue of water preheating and amount of water required uh, issue was there so we need to carry a lot of water in the vehicle and water preheating is also required so because of these disadvantages this steam based vehicle disappeared around 1920 in the market and third comes the electric vehicle technology so this electric vehicle technology was suffered from the short driving range it was unable to climb steep hills and poor battery performance and lower maximum speed so each and every you know uh, industry uh, automotive industry has uh, their uh, disadvantages so it is obvious that the industry which can able to solve these disadvantages faster will become the market dominance so during the previous days these internal combustion engine vehicles were able to solve the problem associated with the starting and it was able to show, solve the uh, shortest uh, range problem the range problem it has solved so it, this industry was able to solve the problem faster and uh, uh, i can say that they were the uh, you know the industries that were leading the uh, you know automotive industry till date but due to the uh, sustainable uh, sustainable way of development we are started to adopt the greener technologies so that is why that is the reason why we are now moving into the electric vehicle uh, era right so so right now uh, you know you can see uh, the uh, the uh, penetration of uh, ev into the automotive sector that is the reason the reason being is that uh, to eradicate the uh, to mitigate the climatic change right right so now <coughs> we are uh, going to discuss about the difference basic difference between uh, internal combustion engine and electric vehicle so before that we will see uh, what is the uh, as a vehicle what is the minimum tractive effort required at the wheels of the vehicle so this curve typically shows the uh, tractive effort requirement for a vehicle and uh, the x axis uh, in x axis we have a vehicle speed and in y axis we have the tractive force required at the wheels so during the uh, initial uh, acceleration phase we need to require a constant uh, or i can say the maximum torque and during the uh, cruising phase uh, you know we have to require the less torque so this is the ideal tractive effort requirement uh, for a vehicle right irrespective of either it is uh, you know the electric vehicle or internal combustion engine vehicle so this is the uh, you know general uh, typical uh, tractive uh, effort requirement for a vehicle so the maximum torque is restricted by this uh, friction and the maximum speed is restricted by this uh, road and acceleration vehicle losses right so this can be further divided into two region one is acceleration region which is this and the hyperbolic torque speed region which is this so this is hyperbolic torque region and this is acceleration region so this is the generalized typical requirement of uh, tractive effort at the wheels and now we will see what is the tractive effort required 
what is the tractor effort for an internal combustion engine based vehicle so these internal combustion engine based vehicles have uh, the constant torque uh, and also it falls uh, at the higher speed right so this is the tractive if you could see the tractive uh, torque um, you know speed characteristics of internal combustion engine vehicle so it will look like this so initially it has a constant torque and then it will falls at the higher speed so these characteristics which we are seeing here does not match the vehicle tractive effort requirements so what is the vehicle tractive effort requirement this is the vehicle tractive effort requirement initially it has to have a, a constant torque during the acceleration phase and the torque has to reduce hyperbolically once the vehicle picks up the speed so this is the vehicle torque requirement but we have the uh, you know uh, track torque of uh, torque characteristics of our uh, internal combustion engine looks like this right if you could match these uh, ic engine torque characteristics with the ideal uh, you know uh, traction uh, curve so it will it will just uh, you know able to cover only a smaller region here so so how we are going to cover the other part of the uh, you know the tractive effort actual tractive effort required by the vehicle it is covered by using uh, the gear arrangement right so we have gears in internal combustion engine vehicles only to cover the various regions of our the uh, actual tractive effort requirement of the vehicle so as you can know as we uh, know that during the initial gear that is uh, in the low gear we can see uh, the the torque will be higher and once in the higher gear uh, the torque is less so by having a different gear arrangement we can uh, achieve the actual tractive effort requirement for a vehicle right now let us see uh, a torque speed characteristic of a uh, electric uh, electric motor so for a fixed frequency of uh, supply voltage the torque speed characteristics is uh, shown here so this is the starting torque and this is the full load operating point so if you would vary the frequency of the uh, input supply for example this is 5 hertz uh, curve and this is 30 hertz and this is uh, 45 and this is 60 so likewise if you could vary the frequency of input supply to the motor supply uh, input supply frequency to the motor we can able to cover the uh, entire region of the uh, tractive effort requirement for a vehicle so by doing this we can uh, we can avoid the multiple gear requirement uh, which is uh, used in the conventional vehicles so this multiple gear requirement become absolute in case of electric vehicles so, so we are able to achieve this merely by changing the supply frequency merely by changing the supply frequency so, so by frequency control we can able to achieve uh, the this characteristics means we can able to cover the complete characteristics of our tractive effort requirement right so this is just a definition for an electric vehicle so so yeah, so any vehicle which is propelled by electric drive time which can be taken power from the rechargeable battery or from a portable refillable electrical energy sources it may be from fuel cell or it may be from solar panel etc so it is which is manufactured for use in uh, use on public roads so this is just a definition for electric vehicle so we all know the advantages of electric vehicle so as we know that it is uh, it has high efficiency and we can implement the regenerative braking in electric vehicles so that is one of the advantages it has much better acceleration and also it can uh, run on renewables we can integrate uh, you know renewable energy sources in electric vehicle for example by installing solar pv uh, panels at the rooftop of electric vehicle so we can able to integrate that and uh, it does not produce any exhaust gases it is it has less moving parts and uh, it is light compact simple and less in maintenance so these are the several advantages associated with electric vehicle now let us see what is the range of an electric vehicle so range is a uh, you know uh, parameter associated with the vehicle which means that how many kilometers it can travel for a single charge okay so the the distance traveled by a vehicle for a 
single charge of the battery is what we call as uh, range of an electric vehicle. Suppose, assume that we have a particular watt hour energy capacity of the battery. So battery capacity is 40 kilowatt hour. And uh, we require 20 kilowatt to run the vehicle at 50 kilometer per speed. So we require 20 kilowatt to run at 50 kilometer per hour. So for in one hour, it will run 50 kilometer. For that, it requires 20 kilowatt power. So the battery now can release this 20 kilowatt power for two hours because the battery capacity is 40 kilowatt hour. So it can run for two hours. So now the range is this 50 into two, so which is 100 kilometer per charge. So this is how you know uh, we can calculate the range for an electric vehicle. Now let us see whether it is conventional. Is, is it economical when compared to the conventional vehicle? Economical in the sense uh, maintenance maintenance wise. Okay, so as you all, as I already know that uh, the electric vehicles are costlier when compared to the conventional vehicles. So that is mainly because of uh, the cost of the batteries. So as the technology uh, improves, uh, it is expected that the cost of the batteries also will come down. So let us now compare how it is economical uh, with regard to the maintenance. So let us say, let us take uh, an average vehicle, uh, uh, the mileage given by average uh, internal combustion. This is internal combustion engine based vehicle, right? So the average mileage for internal combustion engine vehicle is 50 kilometer per liter. For one liter of, uh, uh, let us assume that uh, based on the current price, let us take uh, one liter of gasoline is 100 rupees, right? So for traveling one kilometer, it requires six, we need to invest 6.6 .6 rupees. So we will take the same 40 kilowatt hour uh, battery with uh, 120 kilometer range. So one kilowatt hour electrical energy cost, uh, let us assume that it is eight rupees. So, so for, for traveling 120 kilometer, we just require 320 rupees. So if you calculate per kilometer charge, it is 2.6 kilometer, uh, sorry, 2.6 rupees per kilometer. So we can compare, so it is, the maintenance cost or the running cost of electric vehicle is much uh, you know cheaper comparatively to comparative to the conventional based uh, electric vehicle okay just a moment let me just uh, switch off the camera for a bandwidth issue Okay, now before uh, we will move into an EV design where uh, I have uh, told in the introduction that I'll be demonstrating a simple EV design. So like uh, how to design uh, the uh, motor rating. Yes, hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. <coughs> yes, yeah. So we will see how to design uh, uh, the how to design on the capacity of an electric motor and how to design the uh, charge requirement for the charge requirement uh, for the by the battery, right? So let us take an electric vehicle and analyze that. How how much what is the motor capacity required and what is the battery uh, capacity required for uh, for a particular velocity profile, right? So if you take a vehicle. As you know that there are a lot of uh, resistive forces which are acting on the vehicles in order uh, to restrict the forward movement. One among them is this uh, aerodynamic uh, uh, drag uh, resistance, so which is expressed by this. And uh, the other one is due to the uh, tire uh, friction between the tire and the road surface, which is represented by this, okay, MGCRR cos theta. And uh, the other uh, resistive force is due to the gradient, which is the gradient of the road. So which is represented by this mg sine theta. So these three are the resistive forces which are restricting the motion of the vehicles uh, to move forward. So vehicle has to move in this direction. But there are three resistive forces which are acting on the vehicle, which resist the motion of the vehicle in the forward direction. 
so this is the vehicle direct so this is the vehicle direction and this is the let us say the wind direction is just opposite to that vehicle so in that case uh, you can see from this from the uh, from the formula that uh, uh, it will be greatly affected uh, by the wind velocity so dub you know v w is the wind velocity and v is the vehicle velocity so there are three basic uh, you know resistive forces that we can consider for this analysis so the acceleration of the vehicle is determined by all the forces acting on the vehicle so based on the newton second law we can formulate this so m into the m alpha acceleration is equal to the attractive force ft minus the resistive forces fr is the resistive forces and ft is the attractive force so here m denotes the overall mass of the vehicle and alpha is the vehicle acceleration and ft is the total tractive force to the vehicle so this this is the total tractive force so the total tractive force uh, in order for the vehicle to move forward has to overcome this resistive forces this what are the resistive forces there are three resistive forces one is aerodynamic uh, resistance due to wind and resistance due to uh, tire friction resistance due to tire friction and resistance due to slope. So these are the three resistive forces that we have considered for this analysis. So the tractive effort produced by the vehicle has to overcome this resistive force in order for the vehicle to move forward. So uh, FT is the total tractive force and FR is the total resistive force. So if you calculate, uh, so this is the total resistive forces, which is the summation of these three, uh, you know, resistive forces, which we have discussed previously. So this is due to the, uh, you know, the friction between the tire and the road surface. And this force is due to the aerodynamic, uh, uh, due to the wind. And this is due to the slope or the, the gradient. So yes, these are the three forces which I was talking about. So here, when we take this uh, uh, rolling, uh, uh, you know, the friction resistance here, uh, G is the acceleration due to gravity and M is the vehicle mass and CRR, which is the important factor here in this particular, uh, you know, force is that CRR, which is the coefficient of rolling resistance between the uh, tire and the uh, road surface, right? So, and here uh, is the uh, aerodynamic resistance, which is due to uh, the wind. And rho here is the density of the ambient air. And A, capital A here is the vehicle frontal area. And CD here is the aerodynamic drag coefficient. And V is the, capital V is the vehicle velocity. And uh, V suffix W is the wind velocity, right? So alpha and theta, which is another factor, which is the slope angle or the gradient angle here, as you can see here, this is the slope or gradient angle. So these are the factors associated with the resistive forces. Okay. So the total uh, tractive force. Okay. So from this equation, if you want to compute, what is the tra total tractive force? then uh, we have to take this, uh, uh, you know, resistive forces on the other side. So this is the final equation. So this is, these are all the resistive forces. So if, if in order for the vehicle to, you know, move forward, it has to overcome these resistive forces. Okay. So this, this is the total force. If you want to calculate the total power, we need to multiply this force with the velocity. So if you multiply this uh, whole right hand side with the velocity, so the equation is, uh, you know, uh, changed in this way. Now let us do the calculation, power calculation, which means that how much power is required for the vehicle in order to move forward. So for that, we have to consider some, uh, you know, example. So let us take uh, the mass of the vehicle is uh, 1000 uh, kilogram and uh, uh, we are uh, aiming the velocity of the vehicle at uh, 100 uh, kilometer per hour speed. Okay. So this is the velocity, desired velocity we have taken and the mass of the vehicle is given. So we are just going to substitute. We already derived what is the power required for the vehicle uh, in order to drive at a particular speed. So this is the formula. So other are the constants. Okay. So we are going to assume 
that acceleration. So initially, uh, we will be computing what is the power required by the vehicle in order to overcome the resistive forces alone. Okay. So as we have see, discussed previously, there are three resistive forces. So in order to overcome this resistive force alone, what is the power required? We will be seeing. And uh, for that, we have assumed the acceleration of the vehicle, uh, the acceleration of the vehicle as uh, zero. Okay. And uh, rho, and uh, this is the frontal area and rolling resistance. Wind velocity, we are assuming zero. And gradient also, we are assuming zero. zero. And this is the drag coefficient, which is assumed to be 0.5. So with this, uh, if you could substitute these values to the above equation, and this is just this, just for the simplification that uh, you know converting uh, simplification which shows the conversion of kmph kilometer per hour to meter per second. So 100 kilometer per hour is converted to uh, meter per second. So if you convert, it is 28 meter per second, and this is just uh, uh, conversion of 50 kilometer to uh, 50 kmph to uh, you know meter per second for 150 so we will be using directly this in the uh, then the next uh, forthcoming uh, calculations so just for that so if you could substitute the value of this parameters in the above equation we'll be getting so mass is 1000 so acceleration is zero which is denoted here and again uh, mass is 1000 which is denoted here and g which is acceleration due to gravity which is 9.81 CRR is the rolling resistance here. It is assumed as uh, 0 0.02. It is it is substituted here and um, cos uh, theta. So initially we assumed theta is 0 degree. So cos 0 is 1. So into 1, right? And then 1 by 2, which is 0 0.5. And A, uh, sorry, rho. Rho is 1.2, which is mentioned here. So if you could, we have to just simply substitute all the uh, parameter values to this equation. So if you could substitute and V, the velocity we have considered as 100 uh, kilometer per hour. If you convert that into meter per second, it is 28. So I'm just substituting this 28 here. So if I could substitute, then it will yield 18.94 uh, kilowatt hour. So this is the power which is required by the vehicle uh, in order to overcome the uh, three resistive forces, right? So, so right now the vehicle is at standstill. So just to begin the vehicle, uh, you know, in our, uh, we need to uh, overcome these resistive forces to start the vehicle, to move forward. We need to overcome these resistive forces. For that, we need to require this much of power. Now, let us see what is the power which is required for the vehicle for accelerating the vehicle from zero to 50 kilometer per hour in 10 seconds, right? So for this, we require an acceleration of 1.38 meter per second square. So I'm just substituting this uh, power equation. So, so P power is equal to force into velocity. Power is equal to force into velocity. So force is mass into acceleration. So this is mass and this is acceleration and this is velocity. So if I could substitute, I'm getting 38.64 kilowatt hour. So this is the power which is required for the vehicle to move in this velocity in this particular time. So if you could sum up these two, right, 38.64 plus uh, 18.94, we will get what is the actual power requirement for the vehicle. So also, so this is the actual power requirement, 58, 57.50, uh, 54, 58 kilowatt is the actual power requirement for a vehicle. So how can we choose a motor? We have to choose a motor in such a way that it is capable of, uh, you know, uh, operating with this power 58 kilowatt so now let us see how to choose the battery so assume that the same condition uh, you know uh, and then uh, we are assuming the time taken to discharge the battery from the maximum level uh, is 1.5 hours so also uh, we have to take care of uh, the additional power for the battery so we will be considering 50 percent more power so the battery capacity would be this power, the power of the motor, which is 58 into 1.5 times means this, uh, it has to, uh, you know, uh, discharge in order for the discharge of the battery from the maximum level, we are assuming 1.4. So this 1.4, 1.5 will be coming here. And uh, for the additional power requirement, this is the factor 1.5. So the finally it is computed to be 130. 0.5 kilowatt hour. So this is the battery requirement, battery power requirement 
for satisfying this profile. So let us see the total distance covered by the vehicle. So, so we are running at uh, you know um, 100 kilometer per hour. So uh, we have we have assumed that the battery is discharging the power in 1.5 hours. So if you run at 100 kilometer per hour, so this will be multiplied by 1.5. So we'll be getting 150 kilometers. So we'll be able to cover a total distance of 150 kilometers using the motor power of uh, you know 58 uh, kilowatt and the battery power of 135 130.5 kilowatt so roughly we can have an idea of what is the uh, actual power required uh, by the motor and the battery using these formulas so now let us see how the plot of uh, this power calculation will look like for that i have taken a velocity profile so 0 to at 0 to 20 uh, seconds it is in acceleration phase okay this is the acceleration phase after which we uh, will be maintaining the speed constant. It is cruising phase, I can say. So uh, 0 to 20 is the acceleration phase and 20 to 40 will be the cruising phase. That is constant speed phase. So this is the uh, velocity profile. In other words, uh, these kind of velocity profiles uh, with uh, vehicle uh, terminology is called as uh, driving cycle. driving cycle you can see uh, you can uh, see there are different driving cycles available uh, for the vehicle uh, for the testing purpose especially so for example there is a indian driving cycle so right now um, they are testing in nedc new uh, european driving cycle this is the standard of driving cycle which is uh, followed for the testing of uh, electric vehicle based on which we will, they will be giving what is the range of the vehicle so, which is nothing but uh, driving cycle is the one which is uh, the velocity profile of the vehicle, which means that what will be the velocity. So, x axis will be uh, the uh, time and y axis will be the velocity. So, with regard to time, what will be the velocity of the vehicle? So, it, it, it will have some uh, certain pattern. Each driving cycle will have certain pattern. And, and mostly our um, uh, the driving conditions will also vary. Uh, you know, based on Indian uh, roads and uh, based on uh, the foreign roads, especially in Europe. So they, the Europe uh, countries and other uh, foreign countries, they have their own driving cycles like this in order for testing the vehicles at uh, their uh, environment. And we do have our own driving cycle, but um, recently we are uh, following NEDC, uh, New European Driving Cycle, as uh, you know, criteria to uh, compute the range of a vehicle. Right. So now we'll move on to this. So this is the velocity profile that we are considering. So for this velocity profile, what will be the uh, power required uh, for the acceleration? If you so, if you can see this uh, cyan color, this is the power required for the acceleration, and uh, this is the total uh, tractive power required. So which is more or less uh, 58, okay, 58 uh, kilowatt. So which is uh, matching our uh, previous calculations, right? So and uh, this blue line indicates the power required to overcome the rolling resistance and uh, this green represent the power required to overcome the drag right. and this uh, color represent the power required for the acceleration so if you could uh, sum up these three uh, powers you will be getting this total tractive power so the total tractive power requirement will be around 58 kilowatt right so this is how a power requirement curve looks like okay so <laughs> now we'll move on to the drive tent so drive tent is a mechanism to transmit the you know power from the uh, source to the vehicle wheels i can say or otherwise it can transmit the drive from the engine or the motor of a vehicle to its axle so it can so we will generally say the powertrain components which means that the what are the components which is coming in line in between to you know accelerate this process or uh, uh, to you know which can generate the power and deliver it to the roads so the, what are the they are, they are the basically the components which are responsible for generating the power and as well as delivering it to the road surface for example the power, power train components may be of uh, engine in case of uh, internal combustion engine or it, in case of electric vehicle it is electric motor it is battery uh, transmission drive shaft suspension wheels so from the source to the wheels what are the components associated with that so all these are called as powertrain components so based on the powertrain components uh, there are uh, you know um, 
different uh, vehicle architectures available in the literature. One is uh, we already know that these are the conventional vehicles, which is based on the uh, internal combustion engine, right? So internal combustion engine vehicle. So internal combustion engine vehicle will have a, a, a architecture like this, an internal combustion engine. It is uh, connected to gearbox uh, using the clutch arrangement. And then uh, the power goes to the differential and from differential the torque is splitted among the two wheels right like in this way so there are advantages means um, faster refueling that is one of the uh, major advantages uh, when compared to the electric vehicle which is uh, once we are uh, the fuel is down we can go to the refueling station and we can just fill it in uh, one minute uh, less than one minute i can say so fast refueling is one of the uh, advantages of uh, internal combustion engine and uh, we can able to go for a long range and uh, low cost per unit. There are other disadvantages as well. So like uh, the main one is the exhaust gas and the noise it is producing and it is less efficient. So these are the primary uh, you know, disadvantages of internal combustion engine. In order to overcome these advantages only, we are moving into the electric vehicle. So this is the typical architecture of an electric vehicle. So as you all know, the electric vehicle con consists of electric uh, machine which is powered by the batteries. So batteries are basically uh, powered by the, or the DC sources. So we need to, um, you know, have, suppose uh, our machine is a AC machine or the permanent magnet synchronous machine or BLDC machine, whatever. So based on the power requirement of the machine, we need to convert uh, the power from the battery. So for that, we need to have a power electronic interfaces, right? Also, we can see there is a less gear arrangement when, when compared to the conventional vehicle. This is because we can able to, uh, you know, uh, cover the complete uh, tractive effort using the control possible. For example, the frequency control, as I, as I illustrated in the previous slides, right? So further, uh, it has uh, these advantages, which we have already seen. And disadvantages is that uh, shorter range that is further limited with the battery capacity and higher battery cost this yes this is really a disadvantage for electric vehicle because as the technology um, you know increases improves uh, this is further uh, uh, it, it, it is uh, proposed that it will come down the cost of the battery so low energy density and uh, better okay so there is another category of vehicle which is called as uh, series hybrid electric vehicles so if you call a hy a hybrid vehicles which means that it is using internal combustion engine as well as electrical machine right so in case of series hybrid electric vehicle we have this internal combustion engine as well as the electrical machine uh, this internal combustion engine in this uh, case is used only to charge the battery of the uh, electric machine okay so this is the battery which is uh, powering this electrical machine so this internal combustion engine machine is coupled with the dc generator which will generate the power so this generated power is then utilized uh, to charge the battery so we have a power electronic interfaces for that so this specific uh, you know architecture that is series hybrid uh, vehicle architecture also called as range extenders because uh, they are used to charge the batteries. If you charge the batteries, we can able to travel uh, additional kilometers. Okay, so they are uh, specifically called as range extenders in the literatures. Coming to parallel hybrid electric vehicle. So in parallel hybrid electric vehicle, this internal combustion engine uh, will participate or uh, uh, will help uh, the electrical machine to uh, uh, to make the vehicle move forward. Means it helps in the tractive effort requirement, right? So that is the reason why it is called as parallel hybrid vehicles. Okay. So the, the torque which is produced by the internal combustion engine machine, as well as the torque produced by the electrical machine together help the machine or the vehicle uh, to move forward. Right. So that is the reason why it is called as parallel hybrid electric vehicles. So this is the typical example. Uh, this is a typical, uh, you know, uh, efficiency map of an electrical machine. Uh, to be specific, it is. Uh, for the yeah this is electrical machine here we have an uh, uh, torque in the y axis and speed in the x axis and uh, this is just this is called as map because we are mapping the efficiency also in the torque speed uh, uh, characteristics so as you can see here we have a higher efficiency uh, at uh, this region and um, 
uh, and uh, lower efficiency as the speed increases. So uh, the lower efficiency here is uh, computed to be some 84 percentage. So if typical, if for a typical permanent magnet synchronous motor, if you could take the minimum efficiency would be 70 to 75 uh, percentage and maximum would be 95 to 97 percentage. And on, and on average, we can achieve 85 to 90 percent efficiency. So this is the efficiency map or uh, the fuel consumption map, I can say, for the internal combustion engine. So this is internal combustion engine and this is electric motor map. Right. So if you can see the internal combustion engine efficiency, it is very less actually. So comparative to the electrical engine vehicle. So this may some range between uh, 10 to 45 percent and uh, the average efficiency would be 25 to 30 percent. So control strategy is used in the hybrid electric vehicles. So hybrid electric vehicles, we have just seen that uh, it is a combination of uh, internal combustion engine vehicle plus the uh, battery electric vehicle. So internal combustion engine plus battery electric vehicle. So how we are able to uh, you know uh, manage the power among these two uh, is what we call as energy management of uh, the hybrid electric vehicles. So based on um, this, it is further divided into rule based and optimization based. So there are further categories. These are the, these are uh, you know these are the areas where uh, optimization uh, uh, researchers will work. Uh, with regard to this energy management of hybrid electric vehicles. For example, in optimization, we have this uh, global optimization. For that, we have this linear programming, dynamic programming, and other stochastic controls. When you take the real-time optimization, there comes this um, uh, EC minimization, neural networks, uh, particle swarm optimization, and other techniques. So these are the you know uh, various optimization coming under the hierarchy of rule-based and optimization-based. Uh, control strategies right coming to the conclusions so electric vehicle uh, will be a best alternative for uh, internal combustion engine vehicles which has a zero tile pipe uh, emission which is of course zero percent emission and uh, ev design with regard to electric motor and battery capacity uh, were analyzed in this presentation and uh, Hybrid electric vehicles helps in reducing the CO2 emission into the atmosphere when compared to the conventional vehicles, of course. And powertrain control algorithms are employed to effectively manage the power and utilize the power from source to the load. So this is the, with this conclusion, we will uh, move forward with the second section. Sir, can we proceed with the second session? Yeah, you can. You can proceed. Yes, yes. Thank you for the conclusion. Okay. So in this section, uh, we'll be seeing about the electric vehicle charging technologies. So the outline of my presentation goes like this introduction, uh, where I'll be discussing about the uh, battery uh, charging uh, requirement for an electric vehicle. And then uh, we'll be studying about the battery technologies of uh, electric vehicle. And then the EV charging basics for example, how the charging profile of an electric vehicle or the battery, electric vehicle battery will look like. What are the different phases associated with that? We'll be seeing. And then um, regenerative braking, uh, uh, a typical, uh, you know, uh, example uh, case, a typical case we will take and we will analyze how the easy regenerative braking is implemented in electric vehicle. So, and then we will be seeing the future technologies for the electric vehicle followed by the conclusion so this is how i am going to cover this uh, presentation let us move into the introduction part so as we all know that uh, uh, the electric vehicles are powered by the batteries which are the dc uh, source right dc source so this charging of electric vehicle means we need to supply the dc current we need to supply the dc current to the battery so then only the battery can charge Suppose 
as the electric distribution supplies this uh, ac power so in our household uh, in our household we are receiving ac power so we cannot directly convert uh, connect this ac power to the battery we require a power electronic interfaces uh, to convert this ac power to the dc power and then uh, based on the battery requirement we will be giving it to the battery for the charging right if it if the uh, distribution uh, system is of ac so this is done so further uh, charging can be uh, ac charging as well as the dc charging in case of ac charging the ac power is delivered to the onboard charger in case of ac charging there is an onboard charger available in the vehicle which converts the ac into dc and stabilizes the power based on the requirement of the battery right in case of dc uh, charging the uh, all the conversion will takes place outside the vehicle environment in the charging station exactly so a dc uh, which converts the power externally and supplies the dc power directly to the battery so in this case in case of dc charging we don't have to have the uh, uh, you know the power electronic interfaces uh, inside or on board in the vehicle so all the conversion from ac to dc will takes place outside the vehicle environment that is in the charging station and directly the dc power is sent it to the battery right so this uh, is a table which typically shows um, the battery capacity and the battery voltage uh, requirement for a different vehicle segment so there are uh, basically different vehicle segments mm, available with regard to uh, electric uh, vehicle one is the uh, two wheeler vehicle okay so basically as you know that there are different uh, you know uh, two wheelers available in the current markets indian markets uh, popularly so these two uh, two wheelers are generally powered uh, by the battery with this capacity that is 1.2 to 3.3 kilowatt hour capacity usually we'll have this capacity and if you take the voltage if you could see the voltage of this battery it will be like 40 from 48 to 72 volt so in a four wheeler category we have this uh, battery capacity of 3.6 to 8 kilowatt hour so with this uh, the battery voltage again it is 48 to 60 volt and coming to the first generation electric vehicle we have this um, capacity of 21 kilowatt hour so generally if you take a very basic uh, very basic electric vehicle that is four wheeler electric vehicle i should say the battery capacity should will be like uh, from 21 kilowatt hour and the voltage requirement for the battery is 72 volt right so in second generation electric vehicle that is uh, the vehicle which is suitable for a long uh, driving range the battery capacity somewhere uh, lies between 30 to 80 kilowatt hour and the battery voltage will be in this range 350 to 500 volt so this table just gives us an idea about what is the battery capacity that is that are used in different uh, vehicle segments such as two wheeler three wheelers and the four wheeler uh, based uh, electric vehicles along with the battery requirement so battery voltage requirement right so in order to understand this charging technology and uh, we need to have some basic uh, understanding about uh, the battery there are there are various terms that are used in uh, battery performance so first comes the cell so we will call as a cell cell it is a, a single cell is the complete battery with uh, two current leads and separate components holding electrode separator and electrode it. so it is a complete a, sing, a complete battery is what we call as cell further the cells are uh, you know uh, you know uh, used in a different combination which are called modules so which is basically composed of a few cells either by uh, you know connecting uh, physically phys using physical attachment or by welding in between them so based on the voltage requirement these cells are connected together right in series and parallel based on the voltage we have just seen in the previous table right uh, for a for a two wheeler segment we need to have some 48 to 70, 72 volt so if you could connect the voltages in uh, the, these cells uh, uh, in series we can increase the voltage range so module is a thing which is composed of uh, fuel cells which is connected together to 
satisfy the uh, you know the voltage requirement and pack is it is composed of modules and placed in a, a single con compartment for uh, thermal management so an ev can have more than one pack of battery situated in different locations in the car for example uh, if you take an, a four wheel uh, electric vehicle we have this main battery which is going to power the electric vehicle and also we have an auxiliary batteries which is uh, used to power the our headlights you know uh, fan and other uh, uh, small accessories right so yeah the other uh, term that we are going to see is ampere hour so this is more familiar for us ampere hour it is the capacity of the battery can be specified in ampere hour it is a total charge that uh, can be discharged from a fully charged battery under specified conditions so this is what we call as ampere hour right? coming to specific energy so this is also called, this is called as uh, gravimetric energy density so it is used to define how much energy a battery can store per unit mass also the specific power can tell that uh, what is the peak power per unit mass so this is what we call as specific power both are based on the gravimetric uh, term so the energy is associated with gravimetric energy density and the power is associated with gravimetric power density coming to energy density so previously we have seen specific uh, spe specific energy and specific power and this is different energy density so these terms are we'll be using for you know uh, specific uh, you know, then and there uh, in the battery charging and other techno EV technology, EV terminology. So energy density, energy density is also referred to as uh, volumetric energy density. So it is the normal battery energy per unit volume. Power density is the peak power per unit volume. So there is one more term called internal resistance. So as you all know that internal, there is the battery has the internal resistance and this internal resistance will vary. Uh, uh, you know, based, uh, it will be different for uh, charging as well as discharging condition and it may vary based on the operating conditions as well. So there is a term called peak power according to this US AB, ABC, which is US Advanced Battery Consortium. So based on this, the peak power is given by this where VOC is uh, the open circuit voltage and R is the internal resistance of this battery. So from this, we can calculate the peak power of the battery another important terminology which we'll be using frequently uh, in the literature is that soc which is state of charge so this simply simply tells us what is the remaining capacity of the battery with respect to the rated capacity so this is what we call as state of charge coming to depth of charge which is uh, called as dod so it is used to indicate the percentage of the battery capacity that has been discharged simply we can calculate this by uh, with the soc one minus soc will give you the depth of discharge another important factor is the state of health of the battery as we all know that <clears throat> when we are started using the batteries for a long time the soc or the state of health of the battery will come down means the charge capacity will get reduced so for a aged for the aged battery I mean, for the battery is used for number of charging and discharge cycle, the energy density will be less. So, aged energy density capacity upon the rated energy capacity, which means for a healthier battery or the new battery, which will give the SOH. So, the battery health is determined based on this. Coming to cycle life or life cycle of a battery, so which means that we are doing charging, discharging charging discharging again and again so uh, it is it is it is just the number which says that how many times we have charged and discharged the battery and another important factor uh, is the c rate we have generally here the c rate of the battery which means that uh, uh, charging rate uh, this is this is also uh, used to represent charge as well as discharge rate this is just equal to the capacity of the battery in one hour okay for example uh, we, we will consider this a uh, 5 ampere hour battery if you take a 5 ampere hour battery 1c means 
one C is equal to charge or discharge. It is applicable for charging as well as discharging condition. So for charge or discharge, the battery, uh, the one C of the battery is five ampere. Okay. For example, point one C means ten percentage of this five ampere. So correspondingly, point five C is equal to ten percentage of five ampere, which is point five ampere. If you say two C, then two hundred percentage of this uh, ampere have a capacity which is uh, uh, which is in this case 10 ampere right suppose if we have a 5 ampere battery and uh, we are going to charge this 5 ampere battery with 5c uh, rate 5c rate means uh, so we need to just uh, multiply this uh, c charge rating with the actual capacity of the battery so we can charge this battery with 25 ampere of that so that is the meaning so another important factor is that BMS, battery management system. So this is very important to preserve the health of the battery or the safety of the battery concern. So during, uh, you know, it, it actually monitors and controls how much charge uh, uh, the battery or how much current the battery can, uh, can be used, how much charge can be used for the battery to charge. What is the maximum discharge it can get? So it, it is basically a software along with sensors and other uh, parts. So which is basically uh, used to protect uh, the uh, safety of the battery. So if we have a good BMR system, we can say that uh, the health of the battery and safety of the battery is ensured. And uh, as we all know that the battery will get heated up during charging and discharging uh, process. So uh, I mean, uh, in order to preserve that uh, heating, we have this battery management system in order to take care of the temperature, uh, uh, you know, we have this battery management system. So further, uh, it is um, done using thermal management system, which, which takes care about the temperature. So we are doing the forced air uh, thermal management system for uh, nickel, uh, nickel metal hydride batteries. And also uh, the liquid-based, uh, you know, thermal uh, sis sis cooling system is also uh, followed for the lithium and batteries used in EVs, electric vehicles. Okay, so these are the different terminologies that we should know in order to understand these uh, battery dynamics. Now, uh, let us see what are the current battery technologies used in the EVs. One is uh, po one popular uh, technology that was used. Uh, previously was uh, lead acid batteries. So lead acid batteries, actually it is, uh, it is bulky actually. So when compared to lithium and batteries, it has less, um, you know, uh, energy density. So lithium lead acid batteries and uh, nickel metal hydride batteries. Nowadays, lead acid batteries are being replaced by uh, lithium ion batteries. So these are the, you know, three battery uh, technologies that are used in uh, electric vehicles. So in the emerging field of energy storage technologies, uh, we are, are using uh, the fuel cells, which is having a high energy density and also ultra capacitors. So ultra capacitors are basically used for EVs applications uh, to observe the uh, spikes coming uh, because uh, the, during charging or, uh, you know, during regenerative braking, we may have to send uh, uh, you know high current into the battery which may have some spikes so the ultra capacitors will take care of this um, you know spikes so and also it will helps the battery uh, to uh, it helps ensure the battery safety okay so fuel cells are basically um, you know the energy sources which are used to generate the electricity by means of chemical reaction of uh, two material one is fuel and accident so we have a two element, uh, uh, you know, anode and cap cathode. So to the anode, we will be supplying the hydrogen and to the cathode, we will be supplying the air. So based on this, uh, there will be, uh, you know, separation of uh, protons and electrons in the anode region. And these electrons is uh, conveyed to the external circuit. Uh, so this is how the electricity is generated in uh, the uh, fuel cells. So this is a, this is a one technology for the energy storage. So it has high energy conversion efficiency and it is uh, low fuel cost. Uh, similar to the fueling of uh, gasoline and petrol, the refueling takes place much lesser time in compared to battery charging. 
and it can have a long driving range. The disadvantages associated with this PL sales are it the high initial cost. For example, it is five times costlier as that of uh, the IC engine with the same capacity and low energy density and higher weight are another uh, disadvantages for this. The efficiency reduces with increase in power rating. These are the disadvantages associated with fuel cell uh, technologies. Coming to ultra capacitors, this has higher capacity than electrolytic capacitors. It has high power density as well. Also, it can uh, handle large capacity, large currents. Okay, so this is faster. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, it can the faster charging and discharging takes place in ultra capacitors when compared to batteries. So that is why I've said this is used to observe the interruptions and spikes uh, which are occurring in uh, EV. Uh, during uh, charging or uh, during the regenerative braking operations right now uh, we will see uh, the uh, battery profile actually so a typical uh, battery profile will look like this actually so this is very important as far as uh, the ev charging is concerned so evs are powered by batteries so we'll be uh, we are, will be charging these batteries uh, using chargers so how a battery can be charged will be dictated by this battery profile. So any any battery uh, manufacturer uh, data sheet, if you could take uh, for a specific model of a battery, they will be providing with you uh, with them with the sheet that what is the charge, uh, what is the uh, charging current for that battery, and what is the maximum voltage for that battery. So all these things will be clearly uh, uh, given in the. Uh, data sheet or the specification manual of that particular battery so we need to follow that uh, you know specification data sheets for the battery charging process so it will start like this so initially uh, we need to charge the battery with uh, this uh, constant current so this constant current uh, will be dictated in the uh, uh, will be given in the uh, manual or the data sheet of the battery so for example uh, a 48 volt battery system can have a charging current of uh, maybe uh, yeah, 47 or 45 ampere of current. So we need to uh, charge the battery uh, in uh, with this 47 ampere of current, right? Okay. So initially the charging phase will be started using the constant current mode. So during this constant current mode, if you could see uh, the SOC of the battery will be uh, increasing linearly right at the same time you can see the this curve is the battery voltage curve this curve is the battery voltage curve and this curve is the current curve and y-axis we have the sorry x-axis we have the time and y-axis we have this current and voltage parameters so initially a constant current mode is activated and a constant uh, magnitude of current let us say 47 ampere of current is uh, is passed by the is give, is delivered by the charger to the battery so it, during this process as you can see the voltage of the battery will gradually increase and it will reach a maximum point so this is what we call as the uh, predefined threshold of uh, or we can say the maximum rated level of the battery so which is uh, typically corresponds to 70 percentage of the battery capacity here so this point so it is a predefined threshold maximum rated level of the battery which typically corresponds to 70 percentage of the battery capacity so if the battery charging is continued to reach 100 percentage of the rated capacity using this uh, constant current uh, phase the battery voltage will increase beyond its maximum rated value, which uh, then damages the battery and cause excessive heating. So we are adopting or changing the charging phase to constant voltage phase. So at this point, the constant voltage force, uh, constant voltage phase is activated, which means that uh, we are maintaining the battery voltage constant from this phase onwards. So if you if you are maintaining this battery voltage constant, then the current which is taken by the battery will be automatically decreased uh, in an exponential way and it will reach a minimum value. This minimum value is what we call as the 10 percentage of the full charging current. 
so it is 0.1 into full charging current let us say uh, maybe if this is the full charging current is uh, 47 ampere so maybe it will reach to uh, 4.7 ampere here so once it reaches to 4.7 ampere uh, it, it is assumed that the battery is fully charged so this is just a, a typical charge profile that we need to follow for charging the batteries right now we will see what are the different uh, standards that are available for uh, electric vehicle charging so <clears throat> We have different, uh, uh, you know, standards like uh, SAE J2293, which will uh, tell us about the energy transfer system for the electric vehicles. And also we have this SAE J1772. So this is used for electric vehicle uh, conductive charge. And uh, SAE J, SAE means uh, Society of Automotive Engineers. So they are defining their own standards that uh, we need to follow for uh, during the electric uh, for the for the electric vehicle charging system so this sa sae j1773 will tell us about uh, the inductive charging so there are basically two charging one is conductive charging and another one is inductive charging inductive charging is what we call as this uh, wireless charging right so in india based on this bs indian standard we have uh, we are following this uh, is 17017 is 17017 standard for electric vehicle charging okay so we are following these standards which will give a complete you know details about how to uh, test uh, test the charger okay for example uh, if you are designing a 3.3 kilowatt charger then uh, what are the tests this charger has to uh, satisfy so we need to follow this test even they will be giving uh, what is the you know voltage level and what is the uh, in the current level that you have to uh, follow during the uh, testing phase so we have to uh, you know our the whatever the charger we develop has to come through this test and pass this test so once we pass this test they will give the you know approval or the certificate that yes this your charger has been uh, passed with uh, this uh, voltage surge test or you know uh, the thermal test or overcurrent test whatever so there uh, even uh, the emi test which is very important in case of uh, charges electromagnetic interference so the charger that we have to will be designing should be compatible of uh, you know not interfacing with other uh, electrical appliances uh, in the in the in the near uh, in the nearby uh, periphery so there are several standards and uh, testing procedures uh, which will be given in the standards that we have to adopt and uh, we have to uh, make use of that for uh, clearing the test right so this is a typical uh, electric vehicle energy transfer system uh, based on the applicable standards so this is this is a grid where we will be uh, taking the power to our uh, utility so as you know that uh, <laughs> as since we are taking power from the grid uh, we need to make sure the power quality issue so the power which we are drawing um, from the grid uh, should have some should have the near unity power factor and uh, once we are into the grid then um, uh, through this uh, branch circuit we are uh, connecting to uh, we, we are making a provision to evse right so from here it is then uh, the power is then transferred to the electric vehicle uh it, it may be uh it may be um, through uh, dc charging or ac charging if it is an ac charging we have a converter uh, inside and then uh, for the power electronic converter inside to stabilize the power requirement of the battery and if it is a dc charging uh, we will have uh, this uh, you know power electronic converter external uh, outside the charging outside the vehicle environment and uh, the direct dc power is given to the battery for the charging so in addition to that we have this uh, power electronics uh, you know uh, in co converters or inverters along with uh, the motor controllers so there will be a motor controllers uh, drive which will which is used to drive the uh, you know electric motor at the required uh, frequency and the voltage whatever to control the speed and other operation right so this is the typical uh, energy uh, transfer system uh, 
uh, that is applicable uh, based on the standards. As you can see, there are various standards. For example, uh, in order to maintain the power quality, we need to uh, we need to follow this IEEE uh, standards. And uh, for the vehicle uh, charging system, uh, we need to follow IEC and SAE, International Electrotechnical Commission, and uh, Society of Automotive Engineers. So we have just seen the different standards available for the charging uh, system. So we need to adopt these chargers at different uh, levels. For example taking from the for example taking power from the grid to charging the batteries of an electric vehicle right so based on this standard that is sae uh, j1772 uh, standards they are categorizing this ev charging based on the power level so for example the level 1 charger will have uh, this power uh, uh, charging power which is 1.5 to 3 kilowatt and level two charger will have this power from 10 to 20 kilowatt and level three we have this uh, 40 kilowatt and above this is categorized based on this standard sae j 1772 standard so level one chargers are uh, typically suited for our uh, household appliances so uh, i mean household power supply using household power supply the maximum that we can design uh, the charger is like 3.3 uh, kilowatt hour. So level one charger is basically we are uh, we are uh, you know charging the charging the batteries of the electric vehicle using the power available at our homes. Coming to level two charger uh, is basically a common uh, you know charging station where uh, you can charge uh, the electric vehicle. And um, coming to level three, it is of about it is about the fast charging actually. So fast charging means DC charging. So we will see in detail what is the constraint that uh, you know restricting as uh, in the uh, onboard charger, right? So in case of level three, we do not have any restriction in in terms of uh, component size and other requirement. Uh, so we can have uh, a bulk uh, component system uh, which can give uh, a yeah, high uh, DC power, uh, which is used to charge the battery, and hence the battery can. Uh, take a high DC power and it can charge at a faster time, right? So usually what happens is that uh, when we see any, uh, you know, electric vehicle, uh, they will be mentioning about this uh, charging parameter. So which is basically uh, from, from this uh, point to this point, that is during the constant current phase. So uh, maybe at the end of the um, constant current phase, the SOC will be something around uh, 80 percentage. So they will be mentioning like, uh, you can charge the, uh, you know, for charging the battery from zero to 80 percentage of the SOC, you, it will require only one hour like that. So why this time is short? It is because of uh, the constant current, which is a constant high uh, magnitude of constant current that is being supplied from during the initial phase. So, so they'll be dictating this only. I mean, uh, in the constant current charging phase, uh, how much that, uh, how much the bat, I mean, how much the SOC can be charged? Like, for example, uh, to charge from 0 to 80 percentage of the SOC, we require only this much amount. So this is one of the parameter that you can find in any of the EV vehicle specification. So basically, it will take a quick time to charge to uh, 0 to 80 percent because uh, because of the constant current charging. So after 80 percent, definitely it will take a lesser time, uh, sorry, long time because you can see the, here the charging current is getting reduced. Okay, so it will take some higher time probably. Right. So these are the various power levels which are classified based on this standard and coming to charging methods as we have already seen that there are uh, two different charging methods. One is conductive charging and the other one is inductive charging. Coming to conductive charging, we have uh, AC charging that is uh, we have uh, AC power and we are uh, plugging in the plugging the socket of uh, uh, this uh, charging socket of a car of an electric vehicle to the ac charger and then this ac power is then converted to dc that is suitable for charging the battery using the onboard charger so in onboard charger we have the powertronic interfaces to convert this ac into dc which is suitable to charge the battery see uh, based on the you know power rating see based on the size of the component the power rating of the component um, will be decided so there is a restriction that uh, you know the vehicle has to have this much of weight and this much of space within within that space this uh, onboard charger has to occupy so there are because of this limitation 
uh, it is usually uh, you know uh, be, there is a limitation in the onboard charger requirement and then uh, uh, be, the output of the onboard charger will be the stable uh, you know the power st uh, power require stable power which is required to charge the battery coming to dc charging uh, we have this conversion taking place in the uh, charger uh, board itself so that we call as off board charger because the charger is present outside the vehicle environment so uh, there is no uh, space constraint and uh, limitation on the power rating because uh, the you know uh, the charger is present outside the vehicle environment so here you can see there is no uh, charger uh, you know on board charger present in the vehicle in case of uh, dc charging and uh, the advantage is that we can deliver uh, a high magnitude of uh, current to the uh, battery based on the requirement uh, without any limitations so that is the advantage of dc charging and because of this advantages we can able to charge the battery at a faster rate right so charging charging time it reduces gradually okay coming to inductive charging uh, we have this um, you know this is what this is uh, also called as wireless charging basically so it is like uh, we have will be having a two coils uh, it, it will uh, it is it is based on the principle of uh, mutual induction that is uh, similar to how our uh, transformer works basically so tra our transformer works on the principle of uh, mutual induction it has two coils primary and secondary so when we energize the primary power is transferred to the secondary by the principle of uh, mutual induction so which is similar which is more or less similar to this uh, principle which we are using for wireless charger so there will be of uh, primary primary uh, you know coil and there will be a secondary coil primary coil will be associated with the charger and the secondary coil will be usually uh, in the in the vehicle uh, level so here uh, in this case this is the primary coil and uh, this is the secondary coil which is located in the vehicle so because of the mutual induction the power transfer takes place between the from the primary to the secondary coil and uh, that is how the charging takes place and uh, since there is no you know um, you know direct connection between primary and secondary this is called as uh, wireless uh, charging method so in wireless charging method we have two categories one is static and other one is dynamic in case of static uh, we will be um, there will be a primary coil uh, located at one place and uh, the secondary coil is located in the car so we will be parking the car uh, exactly over the primary coil i mean uh, to align the primary coil and secondary coil so this is like static uh, static char this is called a static ch charging because uh, we will be charging the vehicle at only one particular place so there will be a parking uh, slot available we need to go and park that car at that specific place and the car will get charged in case of dynamic charging uh, the charging takes place during the movement of the vehicle for example the uh, primary coils of the charger are um, are, are present below the uh, road surface okay or buried below the road surface and the vehicle will be in the movement so during the vehicle movement the charging takes place so i mean this this kind of technology is what we call as uh, dynamic charging and another uh, you know terminology this is actually not charging but is a technique that is used uh, uh, in the ev uh, industry which is called as battery swapping so as we know that the charging of the battery uh, it takes more time right so uh, so in order to uh, you know overcome this uh, the policy makers have put forward uh, uh, this battery swapping solution there will be battery swapping stations available similar to the ba battery charging stations where we can go uh, suppose if you are if, you are, if our battery is uh, drained that is the soc of battery has come down to let us say some 80 percent then uh, we can approach a swapping station available and then we can change uh, we can exchange our uh, you know uh, de, uh the less soc battery with a healthy battery and then uh, we are we are off to go means um, we are ready to go so with this uh, battery swapping process gives an advantage that uh, uh, it greatly reduces the you know the refueling process so this technology we can use in order to avoid the you know battery charging time okay 
in case of conductive charging, we have merits as well as uh, uh, and demerits as well. Let us see the merits. So we can charge. So this is a conductive charging uh, to be specific uh, uh, AC charging. In case of AC charging, uh, we have a, a specific or standard electrical outlet and uh, we can charge anywhere uh, using this um, standard electrical output that is one of the merits and um, bms battery management is for the battery management system to communicate easy communication will be uh, one of the benefits uh, for the ac conductive charging coming to demerits there is a power output limitation because uh, the onboard uh, charger has the limitation of uh, size and space because of which there is a power limitation so this is one of the demerits so because of with this power limitation we may not be able to charge the battery faster right because of the restriction in the current magnitude we may not be able to charge the battery faster so that is because of the onboard charger that is one of the demerits so definitely it will take a larger charging time so that is one of the demerit associated with this conductive ac charging in conductive dc charging we have the merits of um, yeah this is one of the primary uh, merits of uh, this dc charging which is no limitation on the charger size and the weight as i already showed that the charger is present outside the vehicle environment so there not be any issue related to what will be the charging size and weight of the body suppose if the if the charger has to be carried by the vehicle then all the factors like vehicle weight and the space will come into picture so since the charger is present outside the vehicle environment we do not have any restriction on the charger size and the weight because of which we have this power level flexibility and uh, i mean high power uh, capability and because of this high power capability uh, we have this uh, less charging time we can able to charge the battery at faster pace right coming to demerits it has uh, high investment uh, cost and then uh, this is available only at uh, public charging station because we cannot incorporate this dc charging in our household appliances because it requires a lot of high power uh, uh, rating so it is available only at the public charging stations that is one of the demerits coming to inductive charging which is wireless charging uh, that to a uh, static charging method we have the merit of uh, convenience and this is more suitable for the self driving cars and it is safe as well and coming demerits, of course, the wireless charging technology is um, under uh, research. So it requires a lot of uh, a high investment cost and uh, limitation in terms of space and weight for uh, charging pads and misalignment tolerance. Suppose uh, there will be a misalignment of uh, coils between the primary and secondary. We have to exactly align the primary and secondary coil for the efficient transfer of power from primary to the secondary. So there will be a, a misalignment issue present with regard to this uh, static charging and there will be a loss due to induction and uh, there is a there is a possibility of uh, this charger that uh, the human has to uh, expose in the uh, you know undergo the radiation exposure right coming to uh, inductive dynamic charging so as we already said discussed that uh, the primary coils are buried inside or buried underneath uh, the road surface and the secondary coil will be uh, uh, will be fitted in the vehicle so the merit is that low uh, uh, stand in charge time because we don't have to wait at a particular place for charging of the battery so low stand in uh, charge time and uh, low uh, depth of uh, discharge and uh, they may, i mean uh, since uh, we can charge the battery on the go we don't have to worry about the size of the battery so smaller battery will also do so you don't have to worry about uh, the location of charging station and so on so that is one of the merits associated with this dynamic charging and there may be some demerits is that there may be some foreign objects present on the roads and uh, abrasion of road surface and because of the weight associated with the vehicle which is traveling on the road the coil structure also changes so these are the merits, oh sorry, demerits associated with the dynamic charging. Yes. So these are the various charging, uh, you know, methods that are available. We have seen. So we will now see some of the um, one of the very important uh, um, technique which is used in uh, electric vehicle, which is regenerative braking. So this is uh, you know uh, one of the way of uh, increasing the range of the electric vehicle uh, which is more efficient as well because 
we don't have to you know rely on the external power source for charging the battery of course uh, 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 you know the driving range uh, with regard to this um, regenerative braking uh, is increased to 8 to 25 percentage only but anyhow we are without any additional energy sources we we are able to meet up this um, regenerative braking so what happens in case of mechanical braking we have this brake shoes which is pushing on this uh, 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 surface so in order to stop the vehicle so in case of mechanical braking the kinetic energy of the wheel is simply wasted as heat energy so which is due to the friction what happens in case of regenerative braking is that the kinetic energy of the wheel is used to charge the battery okay so in case of uh, regenerative braking the kinetic energy during braking so where the way so the vehicle will be going uh, in in some particular speed so we'll be applying a brake so during that time the you know in case of mechanical braking this kinetic energy of the wheel is simply wasted as uh, heat so in regenerative braking we are utilizing this kinetic energy of the wheel uh, kinetic energy of the wheel and then this kinetic energy of the wheel is converted to electrical energy to charge the battery so this is simply achieved by switching on and off the inverter switches for example if you are using a, a ac motor drive um, AC, ac ac motor electrical motor for uh, that is used as a main drive for the electric motor so we can you can simply switch off this uh, you know uh, switch on and switch off this um, uh, switches of the inverter in a proper sequence to achieve this uh, regenerative braking so what we are doing in regenerative braking is that simply we are boosting the back emf of the motor so there will be a back emf associated with the motor and during this um, braking the back emf of this motor will be boosted uh, and then uh, this is uh, further used to charge the battery how this boosting is done it is done using the internal motor inductance this is one way and another way uh, conventionally they are using this uh, boost converters to boost this uh, you know back came of uh, to a higher magnitude and then which is you and then further it is used to charge the batteries so uh, if you are having an inverter motor drive we can use the same inverter motor uh, same inverter for uh, implementing this regenerative braking purpose so further uh, which will use the motor inductance uh, to boost the back emf and this boosted back emf is used to charge the battery so this driving range can be increased to a certain level without using additional energy sources this is very important so the energy which is going to be wasted as simply as heat is used to utilize the, is used to charge the battery hence the uh, it is going to limit the cost of the system because uh, we are not uh, investing on any additional energy sources so regenerative braking is effective for frequent stop and start conditions because if there are in, in urban areas where we'll be dealing with a lot of traffic so we'll be frequently stopping the vehicle and then starting so in that case uh, the regenerative uh, braking technique will come in hand which will be more beneficial also uh, this will be effective during uh, downhill driving condition as well so during downhill driving condition if if you have this regenerative braking capability in our vehicle it is very beneficial right now uh, in regenerative braking there are a lot of uh, you know um, uh, literatures available or research which have went say the idea is uh, that there will be a back emf uh, in the motor this back emf is we need to somehow boost this back emf in order to uh, in order for the battery to uh, charge so this boosting previously or conventionally i can say it is done by uh, the boost converter so uh, in the current research, um, in the recent research, I can say that they are using some techniques called uh, uh, using the motor inductance itself uh, to boost the back EMF. So we do not have any, we do not need any separate uh, boost converter for doing this. So one among this uh, recent technology is what we call as a single switch topology. There are uh, different uh, topologies. Uh, see, this is a, just a case study which is assumed that um, the motor is based on uh, motor is powered by inverter drive a three phase inverter drive it may be of a, a bldc motor or a, a permanent magnet a dc permanent magnet synchronous motor or a, a induction motor 
So any motor which is uh, which is driven by a three-phase induction motor is applicable for this topology. So we will be uh, using one of the topology which is called a single switch topology. So we will see why it is called a single switch topology. And uh, we have other topologies like uh, two switch and uh, three switch topology as well. So in single switch topology, what we are basically doing is that, so here uh, there are three, uh, three legs uh, in the inverter, I can say. So here only two legs of the inverter are shown uh, for the simplicity of the operation, right? So this is a three phase inverter, which has three legs and uh, the operation is associated only with the two legs and hence the two legs are shown here in this picture. So here uh, uh, we, are, we are just controlling a single switch, for example, and what at one particular point, we are controlling only the S4 switch here. So by simply turning on and turning off this S4 switch, we can able to, uh, you know, divert the power, which is, that is, the, uh, that, is uh, that is because of the kinetic energy that is uh, generated because of the kinetic energy to the battery. So let us uh, study this op circuit operation in two phase. One is uh, when the switch is, when the switch is on, that is, in this case, it is only S4. Okay. Now, if the S4 switch is on, what happens is that, through this uh, freewheeling diode of the S6 switch, there is a conduction path. Uh, there is a there is a there is a conduction path for the flow of current. So the uh, motor inductance is used to boost the back EM of S4. So during this phase, the motor inductance of the motor is used, and uh, the you know the voltage is, voltage is boosted, uh, which will be uh, done in the uh, during switch on phase that is when s4 is on when s4 is on there is a conduction path occurs so this switch is on so there is a flow of current in this way and then through the body diode of this switch the conduction takes place in and it is closed so the back EM of of the uh, motor uh, is boosted by using the motor inductance so this energy is now uh, in the second stage, it will be transferred to the battery, which is shown in the green dotted line. As you can see here, there is a green dotted line in this image. So during the S4 switch is on, the power is uh, st uh, stored uh, using the uh, in motor inductance and the stored power is then transferred to the battery using the uh, you know path represented by the green dotted lines. Right. So by simply controlling the switch on and off of this particular switch, we can able to achieve regenerative braking without any additional, uh, you know, uh, converter circuits. So this is applicable only for the convert only for the drive motor drive, which is using a three phase bridge, uh, you know, circuit or polytronic uh, converter. Okay. So uh, see, this is the uh, switching uh, pulse generation for the single switch topology. So, for example, here uh, during braking, you can see there is a back EM of uh, a high value of back EM of at phase A, and during that phase A, uh, during that phase, you can see the switch S4 uh, signal is activated. Switching signal that is for S4 is activated. So during B phase, this is a duration where the back EM of is high. During that time, uh, switching signal S6 is activated. So accordingly. Uh, you can see uh, during the different phases, the S4, S6, and here comes uh, the S2 is activated. So this back KMF is, act, uh, you know, used to charge the, uh, you know, is boosted using the motor inductance during this particular phase, uh, during the switches on, and during the switches, this during the off time of this pitch, then this stored energy is used to uh, charge the battery. So this is the idea behind this. So this particular uh, graph shows that uh, there is a regenerative braking. Uh, that is how much energy that we can gain uh, during regenerative braking. So this typically depends on uh, the duty cycle of this particular switch. For example, if you are considering the S4 switching, uh, th there is a duty cycle associated with this S4 switch. So what we have done during this analysis is that we will first accelerate the motor at a constant speed. Let us say. Uh, we'll take this case 307 rpm so 307 rpm we are just accelerating or cruising the motor at that particular speed and at one particular instant we will be activating this regenerative braking 
so during regenerative braking what happens the motor speed will exponentially decrease and it will comes to zero so the time during this uh, time uh, what is the energy stored is calculated uh, which is by the battery voltage and current and then uh, it is plotted here so based on the different duty cycle uh, and based on the different speed what we can found here is that the energy that is able to recapture during this regenerative braking will vary actually it means it varies in the non-linear form so uh, if uh, of course it will affect the battery uh, stopping time as well so this is a non-linear so uh, if you want to achieve the maximum uh, energy recovery so based on based on this analysis we can be able to fix the a particular duty cycle to achieve the maximum energy recovery of course it will affect on the stopping time as well so which is which is further uh, you know moved on to the optimization problem if you want to have uh, first of all we need to give priority to the opt uh, stopping time and then the possible energy recovery so here in this case um the uh, we can uh, you know design a system to get the possible energy recovery uh, uh, giving priority to the stopping time okay this is just an uh, you know um, uh, res simulation result uh, for this uh, single switch uh, regenerative braking topology for this we have considered a 40 volt 48 volt uh, uh, bldc motor uh, power capacity of uh, 250 watt so this is the motoring phase as i said um during motoring phase the speed is uh, it is cruised to a constant speed and after that uh, this regenerative braking is switched on so it will the motor speed will come down and it will reach to a minimum value and during this phase as you can see the battery voltage has slightly increased okay so hence the battery uh, charging takes place during this voltage and you can see the reversal of battery current as well during the regenerative braking and uh, this image shows the uh, you know uh, the motor armature current uh, during motoring and regenerative braking and this is the vacuum of as the speed decreases the vacuum of is also decreases and it would eventually end up in zero and this is the electromagnetic torque as we can see during motor phase the electromagnetic torque is positive and during the regenerative phase the electromagnetic torque is negative unfortunately eventually it uh, comes to zero once the mission stops okay so this is about uh, a case study of regenerative braking using a single switch topology so coming to the recent uh, electric vehicle powertrain design it can be designed using uh, you know uh, it, it can be designed for high range and uh, you can do some you know optimization in terms of powertrain components and coming to battery uh, with regard to the energy uh, it is associated with the energy density right so with regard to the energy density there are research going on with the battery technology as of now we are achieving this energy that is 200 uh, watt hour per kilogram there are higher energy density batteries are uh, available it is still under research for example lithium air battery lithium sulfur battery is uh, providing high energy densities so the research are going on on this one there are this is a, these are the electric so solar powered electric vehicle where solar pv is installed at the rooftop of the electric vehicle so there are eventually there are um, similar to the conventional uh, you know um, uh, race electric vehicle uh, solar electric vehicle race is also going on in, in some countries so uh, the policy makers are you know um, researchers are uh, you know participating in this EV, EV event so this is a you know flow energy flow diagram of uh, a solar pv based uh, electric vehicle so here we have a, a unidirectional converter for uh, implementing this mppt and then uh, it is given to a bidirectional converter uh, to uh, stabilize to uh, supply power to the battery as well as it supplies power to uh, the motor as well so this is bidirectional so this is the energy flow diagram associated with the solar flow, solar battery electric vehicle and here comes uh, the fuel cell so we need to have a fuel storage system and then we have a fuel st uh, cell stack and this power generated by the fuel cell is stabilized uh, using a power electronic converter and then uh, through the uh, power is delivered to the battery and from battery it is given to the motor so this is how the power flow takes place and this this we have already discussed the battery swapping technology and wireless charging method uh, we have stationary as well as on road and uh, yeah this is one of the important uh, smart charging method and uh, v2g which means that incorporating the renewable energy sources into the uh, micro grid kind of thing 
and then using this renewable energy uh, exploiting this uh, more, uh, more, more renewable energy resources into the distribution network is what we call as um, this uh, smart uh, charging technology and uh, v2g that is vehicle to grid communication is also possible suppose during the uh, peak requirement condition we can we can supply power to the grid uh, from our vehicle battery So, of course, we can uh, use this uh, smart charging uh, technology for AC charging as well as DC charging as well. And uh, this is how this is a smart charging technology flow diagram, uh, you know, for charging the uh, battery as well as uh, we can uh, as well as for the V2G applications. So, in case of autonomous vehicle, we need to have this kind of uh, this. These are the sensors like such as video camera, lidar, ultrasonics, GPS. So, we, this autonomous vehicle will use this kind of uh, sensors for uh, for the navigation and uh, maneuver. Okay, coming to the conclusions. So, we have we have known from the history that electrification is one of the most viable way to achieve this clean and efficient transportation that is crucial to for the sustainable development. So we have seen that rigidity braking is um, effective in case of where uh, in urban condition where uh, frequent stop and stop condition is there. And also it is beneficial during down, downhill driving condition and uh, fuel cell based vehicles are performed for uh, uh, preferred for long haul vehicles uh, uh, due to the faster refueling and easy storage facility. And we have seen that uh, the elect charging electric vehicles using renewable based energy sources will help the sustainable development and leads to the pollution free environment. So with this, I would like to conclude this session. Okay, so now session is open for the query and questions, right? So if you have any query, please go ahead, anyone. Participants, you can ask. No question from my side, sir. Okay, okay. Others? Hello, sir. This is Vinay. Yeah. Yes, uh, please. Uh, sir, like actually, when we are speaking about uh, uh, different types of electric vehicles based on their powertrain or like drivetrain, we yes. speak about series and parallel trains, sir. Yes, so yes. In both series and parallel, uh, the source of uh, charging to the battery will be from uh, outside plug-in source. Okay. So like what is the major difference uh, from series parallel uh, or series parallel architecture to plug-in hybrid architecture? See, uh, series, uh, see, plug-in hybrid electric is uh, technology is where uh, we can able to charge the battery uh, using external power supply using external power supply if you are able to charge the battery this technology is called as plug-in hybrid electric vehicle huh, so yes, yes. The, in series hybrid electric vehicles uh, uh, there there is a you know uh, we, we do not have this plug-in hybrid electric technology itself that means we cannot charge the battery using the internal combustion engine it will be charged uh, okay. so is it like uh, only the source of charging in yes, yes. Will be from the IC engine. yes, 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 yes. Uh, so okay. that is also called as range extenders in huh. the yes. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Because of that specific reason. <laughs> yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, good evening. Good evening, sir. Uh, actually, uh, you have discussed about this uh, single switch charging. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So whether this inverter VSA is inside the charger or inside the vehicle? See, this is basically the inverter which is used to, uh, you know, uh, drive the motor. Okay. Suppose we are, if we are having a, a BLDC motor. It's related with the drive train only. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Exactly. So right. same uh, inverter can be used for okay. implementing this regenerative braking. Yeah, that was only the question. Yes, Actually, yes. Uh, otherwise, 135 switch has no use. Yes, 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 yes. Ah, okay, okay. That's fine. Thank you. Sir, I have a question, sir. Yeah. Yes, yes go ahead. Sir, about the microgrid uh, that we have told uh, here, sir, how it is connected with the electric vehicle and how we will implement it if you want to uh, uh, implement the microgrid with the help of the electric vehicle? Yes, yes. 
So micro grid is a concept like uh, it is uh, smart distribution, right? So anyone can generate the power and utilize it. Suppose if you can integrate, you can also integrate the you know uh, solar PV or wind farms into the micro grid, and yes, yes. Uh, this is further used uh, to charge the uh, battery of electric vehicle. Sir, so so, is there any optimization technique used to be with this? Huh, there are several optimization techniques available, like to manage the power effectively uh, from uh, you know uh, from the different sources uh, to regulate the power. Of course, there are a lot of techniques available in the literature. Okay, sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? So I, I have one query. Yes, Dr. sir. <laughs> Yes, sir. So, how will you calculate the aged energy capacity of a battery? Okay, sir. Uh, the the capacity of the battery will degrade, sir. Like uh, as we are using the number of cycles. Is there any standard to calculate? It? Suppose that the life of battery is 20, 10 years. Yes, sir. Then after five years, how will you calculate the uh, aged energy capacity of that? And capacity initially is 20 kilowatt. Mm -hmm. And how will you calculate? Is there any standard formula? Is this linear or is this a, a any specific uh, way to calculate that? I am also eager to know about that, sir. But as far as my knowledge, if you are using the you know more uh, the battery is at a, put to use for a long time. Suppose you are saying the twenty kilowatt. Okay. So this twenty kilowatt will further mm -hmm. reduce to fifteen or let us say ten kilowatt hour. So that is how the degradation happens. And uh, I would like to explore, sir. How, what is the uh, yeah. technique uh, used for that? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, not an issue, not an issue. So, is there, is there anyone having any query? Otherwise, we can close here. So, if no query, then I request you all, please turn on your camera for the capturing the attendance. Then, Doctor Vikram, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so then, my coordinator, Doctor Vikram, will hold the session. For final wind up. Everyone, please turn on the camera. Rajesh, are you ready? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am ready. Mm. So, ready with our attendance. So, one second, sir. Mm -hmm. I am taking a screenshot. Mm. So done. Okay, thank you. Professor Vikram. So it's my turn, sir. Yeah, yeah. now it's your turn. So thank you very much, my dear colleague, Padma Girisan. Thank you, sir. For providing us with uh, lots of introduction and working about the electric vehicle. Through the presentation, I thought I was inside the presentation only, going through the <laughs> practical things, as I am very much interested in the same field and trying to work a little. So I hope the presentations has given a large this, uh, area of work for the research scholars who are attending the, the Auto Lab DB. So, I thank you very much to Padma Grisan as well as uh, Dr. Arvind Jain sir for uh, organizing such types of auto lab DP and also from the department as well as NIT Agartala and the participants. I thank you Padma Grisan once again. Thank you sir. So here we comes to the end of the session. So we shall leave. Good night. Bye bye.